Welcome to the Innovation and Compliance Podcast, part of the Compliance Podcast Network. Join us every week as we talk with industry innovators who are making compliance to help business run more efficiently and at the end of the day, more profitably. Here's your host, Tom Fox. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox back for another episode. And today I have with me Dr. Gleb Tiborski. Hope I got that right. And he has one of the most interesting practices I have heard of lately. We connected social media and I asked him if he could come on the podcast. He works in the field of disaster avoidance, not disaster recovery, not forecasting a risk assessment, but a much broader remit. So I was extraordinarily fascinated with the work he's done and he was gracious enough to take some time to visit with us. So first of all, thank you for taking the time to visit with us. Thank you for inviting me, Tom. It's a pleasure to be on. So let's start off with what is the field of disaster avoidance? Well, I've heard of the field of disaster recovery and risk forecasting. Disaster avoidance is actually how do you avoid those disasters? Ben Franklin said an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. And that's a wise phrase, you know, avoiding a disaster is always preferable to recovering from it. So how do you avoid a disaster? Well, you have to understand where disasters come from. There are only two things that lead to disasters. And they come all from our decisions, just to be clear. Our disasters come from our decisions. Only two types of decisions. One is an active decision, where we make a decision ourselves that leads to a pretty disastrous situation. We could talk about that. There's plenty of situations like that. One or a series of decisions. That's kind of one disaster. The other types of disaster comes from when we fail to make a decision when that we need to make to avoid a disaster. So there's an external stimulus, we fail to make a decision that would lead us away from disaster. And of course, disaster, by definition, is anything that makes a significant negative impact on your bottom line, on your career. So that's what a disaster is about. And I study the kind of decisions that lead to disasters, whether are active decisions or failing to make a decision. And then my expertise specifically is how do you avoid these sorts of problems? How do you prevent disasters? And these are the dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases that we're going to talk about that lead to pretty disastrous situations. So I think many people will be familiar with that, perhaps from the quantitative perspective. But as you just articulated, you come at it from a little bit different perspective, the behavioral psychologist and behavioral aspect of cognitive biases. So I was wondering if you could start with why did you come up with this mission? Well, I'm really on a mission to protect leaders from these dangerous judgment errors called cognitive biases because I saw how much suffering they cause. I've always been passionate about helping people avoid suffering. And when I see the kind of dangerous, so well, just to clarify, I grew up, I was born in 81. I came of age in 1999 when tech leaders were partying, like it's 1999 for Webvan, Pets.com, Boo.com. And then just a couple of years later, all of these tech companies went bust in the dot-com boom and bust. And I saw that the tech leaders who are praised as the titans of industry and the best decision makers in 1999 in the Wall Street Journal and so on, they were the heroes. And now they just became the zeros just a couple of years later. It showed me the high danger of making bad decisions. And I saw that nobody was really studying this. How do you avoid these disasters? How do you avoid these bad decisions? And when I started studying this, I had to go into academia because that's really where they study decision making, you know, besides the kind of BS that you hear about going with your gut, following your heart, trusting your intuitions, kind of the magical systematic thinking where just because you feel something, it's the right thing to do. That's absolutely incorrect. And of course, your listeners know this because they know the data about this. But what they most likely don't know is the behavioral science behind it. Why do we make such bad decisions? And that's what cognitive biases are about. They are the kind of decision-making patterns, the bad decision-making patterns that we tend to fall into because of how our brain is wired. And unfortunately, our gut reactions, our intuitions, are not wired for the modern environment. That's just simply the fact. Our gut reactions are wired for the savannah environment. When we lived in small tribes of 15 people to 150 people, when our primary threat response was the fight or flight response, I mean, that was great for the savannah environment when we had to get away, flee from that saber-toothed tiger So I had to jump at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber to tiger. Great for that environment when threats we faced were intense, immediate in the moment, but it's terrible for the modern environment. And we still respond with a fight or flight response to modern threats, even though they're long-term, ambiguous, uncertain. They're much more likely to come from a notification on your 
smartphone, about some kind of email that you're getting with a client who is upset about some situation. And the temptation is to ignore the email because you don't want to deal with it or to respond aggressively. And neither of those is the right response. But anyway, that's an example of how we are not wired to deal with the modern environment if we just go with our gut. And that's what I wanted to study to how to prevent these dangerous judgment errors, how to deal with them effectively. I wanted to ask you, what are the three top judgment errors you routinely see in business leadership? But I think I would much prefer to ask you, what are the three top examples of magical thinking you see that lead to errors in business judgment? Those are pretty similar things. So the magical thinking comes from cognitive biases. One of the biggest types of cognitive bias that leads to magical thinking is overconfidence. This is one of the biggest and most dangerous cognitive biases for business leaders. There is a widespread perception that leaders need to be confident. They need to be confident. They need to exhibit confidence. They need to always be confident in their decisions. They need to make a decision and they stick with it. And then they go forward implementing this decision. That's a very common story. And that's a very common fallacious pattern of thinking. Now, why was it fallacious? Well, because when you look at confidence of leadership, you will see there is extensive research showing that the more confidence a leader exhibits, the more overconfidence, excessive confidence, the worse their business performs. And it's often the case that leaders earlier onward in their careers have less confidence and they perform better in their business decisions, and then they get promoted to a higher level and then they feel more confident, and then they perform worse. And there's extensive research showing that people who are more confident, if they lead a company, CEOs, they tend to overpay for mergers and acquisitions. So they tend to overpay for companies. They tend to fail at mergers and acquisitions. They tend to hire worse people. So the people they hire tend to leave earlier. There's a lot of problems. This overconfidence is unfortunately just a human trait, and it's called the overconfidence bias. We can get away from it if we realize what we need to do is separate the process of decision-making from decision implementation. So decision-making, when you make a decision, that's a good place to actually not be confident. You don't want to be confident when you're making the decision. You want to look at a whole variety of factors, listen to a whole variety of people, not be confident in your judgment because we tend to fall into bad patterns when we're confident in our judgment. When we should be confident is after we make a very carefully considered data-driven informed evaluation and then implement the decision. Now, when we're implementing, that's when we should show confidence in the implementation. We need to motivate ourselves with our confidence. But when you're making the decision, it's a terrible thing to be confident. And that's when leaders fall into various big problems that you don't want to fall into. So that would be one type of magical thinking that I would see. Another type of magical thinking that, again, comes from cognitive bias, is called sunken costs. And here is where leaders, once they launch on the project, they tend to throw more money and more resources at the project, and they keep going with it because they feel, well, I started on this project, you know, if it's not going well, it will reflect badly on me if I stop, and therefore I should keep doing it and power through and go to the end. That's a very big problem because sometimes during the implementation of a project, you will understand and recognize that it will cost a lot of resources to finish this project, way more than it deserves. There's a reason most product launches fail. So if you look at product launches, you'll see that most of them fail because leaders tend to keep sticking with a plan that doesn't work and don't pivot in a timely manner. About half of all startups fail within the first five years and three quarters fail within the first 15 years. Again, because people tend to stick with the wrong plans. They don't pivot in a timely manner. So this sunken costs, that's another cognitive bias. It's called the sunken costs bias, where we tend to throw good money after bad because we don't want to admit that we're wrong. It feels very uncomfortable for leaders to admit that they're wrong. It feels very bad. And that's a very unfortunate tendency that leaders don't want to admit that they're wrong. So that's the second type of magical thinking cognitive bias. And the third type is looking for the world through rose-colored glasses. That is such a big tendency when leaders tend to look at the world in a way that confirms their pre-existing beliefs. They ignore all sorts of information that goes against their beliefs, and they only look for information that confirms their beliefs. That's called the confirmation bias. 
And you'll tend to see a lot of leaders run companies into the ground because of confirmation bias. They'll ignore information that the market conditions have shifted, or they'll ignore information that things aren't going very well in the company because it doesn't fit their image of what the company is or what the market is. So they look at the company and they let their blinkers inform their vision of the company. They look at the external market, they let their blinkers inform their vision instead of taking off their blinkers and realizing we all tend to fall into confirmation bias. So you need to look much more heavily for information that goes against your beliefs, that goes against your preferences. And that's the way you fight confirmation bias. And that is the third type of magical thinking that I wanted to bring up. So in a blog post entitled Three Key Empathy-Based Methods to Uncover Truth About Your Stakeholders, you discuss three key social media intelligence methods. How can a business leader use social intelligence methods? Social intelligence has to do with understanding others and being able to influence them effectively, understanding their emotions. Because what happens with others and ourselves, we are overwhelmingly emotional creatures. Now, we don't often talk about emotions in business, and that's a really bad idea. Because emotions, the recent research on this topic shows that they drive about 80 to 90 percent of our decision making. They all come from our emotions. So we need to understand our emotions and other people's emotions. Now, understanding your emotions and managing them has to do with emotional intelligence. If you want to influence others, that has social intelligence, understanding their emotions and influencing them. In the blog post, I talk about three methods that you need to use. You need to use, first of all, empathetic listening. It's not about specifically caring about people. That's not what it's about. Empathetic listening has to do with listening for what other people are feeling, looking at their body language, their tone of voice, the content of what they're saying, of course, and what they're not saying, in order to understand the feelings behind the words. The feelings behind the words will determine much more of their behaviors than just the content of the words themselves. So you need to do empathetic listening to understand what they feel. That's first. Then you need to build up rapport with them. And you build up rapport with them through echoing and mirroring. So whatever the other person says, you want to echo in a very short burst what they're saying. And especially you want to echo their emotions. And you want to mirror their emotions. You want to show that you're connecting with them. People like to feel connected. So you want to connect with them through that echoing and mirroring, building up that rapport. And finally, curious questioning. Curious questioning is the last method that I talked about in the blog post. Curiosity is really helpful to express about things that are especially issues of contention, issues of question. And if you are not sure about their emotions, you can certainly use that to clarify what their emotions are, what they actually feel. And you can also address issues of contention, conflict with curious questioning about what's going on. So that's what's going to be a very helpful combination for you to use. Empathetic listening to understand their emotions, echoing and mirroring to build up rapport, curious questioning to clarify their emotions, and to address any issues of contention about the situation. Can I ask you to define or tell us the differences between two terms you used, emotional intelligence and social intelligence? So emotional intelligence has to do with awareness of yourself and being able to manage your emotions. That's what emotional intelligence is about. It's all self-oriented, so focused on yourself. You want to, again, we're driven overwhelmingly by our emotions. People are not nearly aware of how much their emotions drive them. They let their emotions drive them in the wrong direction when they go with their gut, follow their intuitions. They're not aware of what's going on. So the first part of it is awareness, being able to understand how our anxieties, our passions, our fears, our anger, our frustration, our desire, our hopes, how they all drive us in certain directions. So you want to understand that. And then the second part of it, understanding, awareness, the second part of that is being able to manage them. You can influence your emotions. Now, that's actually a surprisingly hard thing to do when you're feeling anxious. It's hard to get back from that brink and not let your anxiety drive you. But you can, over the long term, there are a number of methods that you can use that I described in my books, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions, and The Blind Spots Between Us, How to Overcome Unconscious Cognitive Bias and Build Better Relationships, that you can use to understand your emotions and influence them effectively. So that's the emotional intelligence. Social intelligence is the same thing applied to other people. You want to be aware of their emotions. You want to use empathetic listening and other tools that I describe in my work to be aware of how they're feeling and to be aware of their relationship, mainly their feelings about other people. 
their feelings about you, their feelings about the external world, their feelings about other people, their connections with other people. So that's awareness. And then the other component of social intelligence is being influenced, being able to influence other people, their emotions, their connection to other people. So that's what you want to be doing. That's the combination of emotional intelligence that's about yourself and social intelligence that's about other people. I was extraordinarily pleased to see that you believe stakeholder engagement is a key action of a business leader. Could you explain why you feel that way? Oh, I feel that way because it's incredibly important for business leaders to be able to influence others. Now, if you think about the work of business leaders, the leadership is essentially about stakeholder engagement. That's what it's about. You want to influence others to follow you in a certain direction. And what is stakeholder engagement except that? You are engaged your stakeholders, your internal stakeholders within the company, whether if you're a leader at the lower level, that can include your supervisors, your peers, your subordinates. And of course, if you're at the highest level, that includes everyone in the company who are your subordinates. So that is stakeholder engagement within the company. And of course, stakeholder engagement outside the company. There are all sorts of stakeholders who you want to influence and get to do what you want them to do to accomplish your leadership goals. So for a leader to accomplish their leadership goals, the essence of leadership is effective stakeholder engagement. So seeing various stakeholders and being able to engage them to get them to go in the direction that accomplishes your leadership goals. Probably as long as I can remember, I have been told, trust your gut. And it's a phrase I learned as a young boy. I heard it as a teenage boy. I heard it in my 20s and beyond. Why is that the wrong approach for a CEO to take, in your opinion? Because our gut leads us in the wrong direction so often. I talked about three cognitive biases, three types of magical thinking. There are actually over 100 cognitive biases. So you can look at the list of cognitive biases on Wikipedia and find out all the fun and destructive ways that our brain leads us in exactly the wrong direction. My book, Never Go With Your Gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, talks about the 30 most dangerous ones in business settings for your career, for your finances, for your company, and how to address these effectively. And you want to be aware of these. The cognitive biases, the essence of them is how our gut goes in the wrong direction. Our gut is not a useful tool for leading in a business setting. It's a great tool for the savannah environment when we lived in those small tribes. But in the modern environment, it's just as often going to be wrong as it's going to be right. So you never want to simply trust it. You want to step back from your gut and you want to check with your head. Again, sometimes your gut will be right and sometimes it will be wrong. But you should never simply trust it. You should never simply go with your gut. You always need to check with your head. And plenty of times you'll need to use your head to overrule your gut because your gut will be causing you to be too confident. It will be causing you to throw good money after bad. It will be causing you to look at the world through those rose-colored glasses. And you don't want to do that if you want to actually be a successful business leader or a professional of any sort. In the era of Black Lives Matters, how can a CEO help to fight unconscious bias in an organization? They want to realize, first of all, what unconscious bias is about. So many people talk about unconscious bias from a shame-based, guilt-based perspective. And that's not what it's about. Unconscious bias is simply a part of being human. It's a natural, primitive part of our gut reactions. We are all tribal creatures. That's the in-group, out-group part of who we are. And it's very natural. It's very intuitive. It's that primal self. We are born to be tribal. That's the gut reactions. Now, we can overcome our gut reactions as we can overcome a lot of problematic habits that are left over from the savannah environment. You know? We attempt, for example, in the savannah environment, it was very important for us to eat as much sugar as possible when we came across a source of sugar. That was what enabled us to survive and thrive then. In the modern environment, if you come across a box of dozen donuts in the break room, it's a bad idea to eat all the dozen donuts. That's not going to be healthy for you in the modern lifestyle. But it's very tempting once you start eating sugar to keep eating it. And fortunately, I'm sure most of the listeners or all of them have developed paths for themselves to have a healthy physical diet, even despite the triggering by sugar. And that's just one example out of so many where when we're triggered by tribalism, we need to figure out where it's hurting us, where it's causing us damage, where it's causing us to unconsciously cause us to underestimate, underrate other people. So that is the first step, understanding what's going on, where these tribal reactions are coming from, where they're causing us to make bad decisions about others. 
And then how can we address them effectively? There are a number of ways to address tribalism. Again, the first step always comes with realization, and that's the emotional intelligence. So you want to be aware and then managing it. How can you manage it effectively? You want to give people who are not part of your tribe more credit than you intuitively feel they deserve. And that's a hard thing to do, but it's definitely doable if you have clear metrics of evaluation and evaluate people against objective numbers rather than against a gut feeling of whether they're good or bad, which unfortunately way too many business leaders tend to do. So that's the first step for yourself. And then, of course, you need to influence your company, your organization, your team to do the same thing, to be aware of these gut reactions and to evaluate others on objective metrics where you don't trust your gut reaction especially with people who don't belong to your tribe, and look at the objective, clear metrics of evaluation to evaluate them effectively. Dr. Sikorsky, unfortunately, we are near the end of our time, but I was wondering if our listeners wanted more information on yourself, your practice of disaster avoidance, or even some of the books that you've published and written, where could they go? Well, my books never go with their gut, How Pioneering Leaders Make the Best Decisions and Avoid Business Disasters, and The Blind Spots Between Us, how to overcome unconscious bias and build better relationships are available in bookstores everywhere. So you can check it out there. They're available also online, of course, in Amazon Barnes. They're all published by great traditional publishers, Career Press and New Harbinger for Career Press for Never Go With Your Gut, New Harbinger for The Blind Spots Between Us. They're available also in audible form. So you can check it out on audiobooks. My own resources are in disasteravoidanceexperts.com. That's blogs, videos, podcasts, decision aids, guides, manuals, classes, consulting, coaching, and training services. Especially check out the free eight video based module class on disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. Again, that's a free eight video based module class on making the wisest decisions possible. And as part of it, there is an assessment on dangerous judgment errors in the workplace at disasteravoidanceexperts.com forward slash subscribe. And I would just add for our listeners, The website is just a fabulous resource. It's got blogs, it's got the videos Dr. Gleb talked to us about, and many other resources that if you want to take a look and learn something, you want to take a deeper dive, it's a great place to start. Thank you so much for taking the time to visit with us, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Me too, Tom. Thank you so much. If you're a compliance professional looking for a convenient and effective way to fulfill your continuing education requirements, go to fcpacompliancereport.com slash courses and choose from four hour-long training packages that will keep you current. That's fcpacompliancereport.com slash courses.